Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Carl Gould, who is over in New Jersey on the East Coast of the United States. How are you doing, Carl? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Excellent. And Carl is four-time winner, Entrepreneur of the Year. He is a worldwide leading authority on business and entrepreneurship, and his company, Seven Stage Advisors, helps organization grow to the next level, organizations even grow to the next level. And today we're going to talk about the seven stages to growing a business. Um, so Carl, let's get, let's get straight into it. Um, number one, where did your seven stage process come from? And then let's get into the process itself. Sure. So I, I was studying under a, uh, an organizational life cycle guru called Ichak Adizas in the early 2000s. And I, you know, in the 90s, when I started out as a coach, there were no real systems. There were no processes. Mm -hmm. I, I was doing um, work with a whole bunch of people. And I was, I was like, where's this going? The, the industry was fragmented. And so I start working with Ichak Adizas. And it really started to strike me that there's a real formula here because he has a whole growth formula for large organizations and organizational life cycles. But I said, you know what, this is really suited for the small to mid market. And, and so I started to notice what are the patterns of success for businesses and uh, where do they tend to get in trouble? And then I started to notice, wait a minute, I see a lot of companies doing the right things, but in the wrong sequence. Mm. And then I started to notice that, wait a minute, sequence matters here. There are certain things we should be doing and there's certain things we shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, in, in at certain times. And I learned that if you're doing the right thing at the wrong time, you're, you're not going to be as successful. And so uh, the seven stage uh, growth method was to show people what sequence you're supposed to be doing things in and where are you supposed to be putting your major focus and your minor focus so you can get the maximum out of your time and effort. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of times people are probably doing the right things, but not doing them in the right order. And we have a certain bias towards starting to do things that we like doing or things that seem like they're easier than others rather than doing things sequentially. So let's, uh, so let's walk us through your seven step model and then we can dive into a couple of them. Sure. So stage one is the strategic planning stage where you want to have mm -hmm. a compelling and inspiring uh, business model and um, you get all those great ideas out of your head and onto paper. Stage two right. is specialty. And that's when an, uh, an authority or a, an expert is born. Stage three is synergy. And that's when you're building your team, right? A team is born that is aligned with your mission, vision, values, purpose. Now stage four is when we start to get into the stages of scale. And that's the systems stage. And that's when you decide what kind of business model are you going to be? Stage five is what we call uh, scalability or sustainability. That's when you, you're known for something other than your product or service, like your experience or your convenience or mission, what you mean like your cause-based mission. And so um, you, that's when you can really start scaling your business. Stage six is saleability. And that's when an asset is born. That's when you've built your management team um, and you don't need to be there every single day. You can IPO, you can roll up other companies, you could buy, you can sell, and you'll maximize your saleability. And then stage seven. Stage seven is succession. And that's when a legacy business is born. And that's when you can fire uh, employee number one. That's right, mm -hmm. you, right? right? And, and when you announce that you're leaving the day-to-day -day operations of the business, your, uh, your company is actually worth more. And the reason why is because of, uh, of the leadership and the legacy that you've left in place. Right, right. Um, excellent. So let's go, let's go back uh, to the very beginning there on the strategic planning part. I do feel that, I mean, this is true of all businesses. I do think that even today, a lot of people still don't understand how to do strategic planning properly or what strategic planning really is. To some people, it sounds like it's a very complex and you know time-consuming thing. Um, whereas when it's done, done properly, it doesn't have to be, right? That's right. If you, if you, you know, they say that a, a problem well-defined is a problem half solved. And what mm -hmm. I've learned in the coaching, in the coaching um, I've done over the years is that if you haven't identified not only where you are right now, very specifically and very specifically where you want to take the business and at least some measure of a, how you think you're going to do it, you'll flounder about for a while 
and, and you see it every time there's a downturn. I mean, the pandemic is an extreme, but the anytime there's a downturn, there's a recession, there's a change in legislation, some outside force that that business wasn't expecting, it seems to hurt them exponentially. And you know, mm -hmm. you scratch your head and you say, well, wait a minute, they seem like a really good business. You know what? Well, they didn't have a plan that compensated for some of those challenges. The other thing that the plan can help solve is price elasticity. In other words, you get to charge more if you have a compelling enough plan. You right. know, like um, that company 4ocean.com that sells you the bracelets because they're going to clean a pound of trash out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Well, a bracelet, if they didn't have that mission or that cause, would be under $5. Yeah. But you buy that bracelet for almost 20. If Well, I bought mine for over, but it's now a little under 20. But um, yeah, you're, you're spending, there's a lot of margin when you have a compelling plan and you need it when you start growing. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think then the, the second point that you said is then figuring out there or your second part is figuring out where you can specialize really it because I mean, let's face it, you can, you can have a good idea, you can get into an area, but you can very quickly just become another commodity. Just like you said, you could just become another bracelet in the, in a world of bracelets. Yeah, and, and, and it's actually worse right now, John, because we are in a season of business that is called winter, okay? Not just because it's winter on the calendar, but it's winter because every 20 to 25 years, we go through kind of these cycles. And in 2005, we entered winter, and winter is, um, is estimated to go through 2025 to 2029, depending on how the government puts in entitlement programs or kicks the can down the road. So somewhere in there, uh, we'll come out of it, but we're in winter until that time. So a good another five years at least. Now it's counterintuitive, but the more volatile the economy and the more disrupted the economy is, the more buyers are willing to pay more for your products or services if they believe you're an expert. So mm -hmm. think about that for a second. You not only don't want to be in the middle, middle is invisible in winter. It's the preferred buying strategy in fall because people trade their time, their money for convenience. So if you just give them a little discount, they're like, oh, you saved me the time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Nobody needs to save time now. I got all that on my phone. I can condense time all day long. I can, I can, I can search this stuff out faster than you can. You don't need to save me time. You need to show me you can get the job done right the first time. That makes you an authority. I'll pay you more for that. So not only do you want to be higher priced, but you need to be higher priced in order to be seen as an expert in your authority, authority in your niche. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always the people always raise that classic one of like IBM, I think in the recession in the 80s or whatever, where they were able to not only raise their prices, but grab market share because, you know, no, what was that old saying? Nobody got fired for buying IBM. That's right. And, and look, you, you, don't, you don't see Rolex out there running a promotion right now. <laughs> You don't mm -hmm. see Tesla like, oh God, well, you know, if you uh, BOGO, you don't see that because they don't need to because they've established themselves as, hey, we're among the top, if not the top in our respective niche. We don't need to, mm -hmm. you know, a Apple, Apple doesn't need to, you know, uh, so, so there, and, and it doesn't have to be luxury brands, Walmart, you know, there are other brands that where they don't, they could be lower market, mid market, higher market. That doesn't matter. It's just, so, oh, here's a perfect example. The only car company since 2009 in the United States, major car company that has increased their sales every year is, wait for it, Subaru. Mm, yeah, no, I can believe that. Yeah, they know their clients as good as any company that I've ever seen. Brilliant. Yeah. They're so brilliant. And they're an economy brand. They're a value brand. Doesn't have to be luxury. You know, it could be an economy brand. Yeah, no, it's a, it's interesting you you mentioned that. And I think that's great, and I think it's it, that's so important that you figure out you know your speciality, figure out how you're going to be that trusted, uh, you know, trusted brand or trusted company, the expertise. The other thing that I noted you have in here in the very center is systems, and I think that's a, an area that's going to challenge a lot of people going forward because. Um, digitization and digital process and digital transformation of businesses and, and workflows and processes that had already started, but a lot of people kind of pay lip services because you could during good times, you can get away sometimes without having things perfect. Um, but since the pandemic now and going forward, you got to get your systems in, you got to get your systems right and you got to get them in place and you've got to focus on them first and not come back to them later. 
Yeah, yeah, you know, it's um, it's interesting because there there is a timing with systems, um, mm -hmm. for sure. Like you know, a plane doesn't take off and land on autopilot. Um, you know, and a couple of times a year sure. that that happens, it's it's news. As long as you time the systems right, absolutely, you can't scale your business without it. And and people oftentimes will say growth and scale are the same thing. And and I draw a line between the two and I say, listen, growth is just hustling more. It's hustling more, it's you're being effective, but you're not really being efficient. Systems is when you start thinking about automation, you know, it doesn't need you each and every time. Some of these things happen without you. And so you're putting replicatable, duplicatable processes in place. So your, um, so your employees, your staff, your vendors know what to do without you. So the velocity of your business can speed up. I mean, imagine this for a moment. If I told you we're going to together, hey, let's, let's grow one of the top restaurant chains in the world, but we're not going to put a chef in any restaurant. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about that, that's what McDonald's did. You know, just the thought, just the thought of that. I'm going to build a law firm with no lawyers. I'm going to build a restaurant with no chefs. Like what? And yet that's what they did. And they were only able to do it because they systematized. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really, I think that's really important because a lot of people think that that comes later. And I think that, uh, you know, it's something that you need to be thinking about, um, think about from the get go. And your point on scalability is a good one too, is because sometimes people think, yeah, you can grow and you can throw people at an issue. So you can keep adding people and you can, uh, you know, your processes can be um, offset by adding more people in and more people in, but that's not a scalable solution in the long run. So you have to start thinking about automation and, and good workflows and, and processes, et cetera. Yeah, from the get go. Now in, in our model, stages one, two, and three are pr the proof of concept model. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so we suggest systems kick in at stage four because you're still feeling out like what, what kind of business are we, what are we going to be when we grow up and, and what exactly are we going to be in the marketplace? And, and if there's pivots that are necessary, like remember Intel is a chip company now, but they were a storage company in the beginning. I mean, they pivoted right. from that because they said, wait a minute, I'm not so sure we can win that game, but boy, I think we can win the processor game, the chip game. And so they pivoted early in early enough when they could do it. So they had the flexibility in place. They didn't over systematize to the point that they became inflexible. So we're huge fans of systems. Let's just find that right spot. Mm -hmm. As soon as we get proof of concept, we, we know, we know what it takes to um, find the, find the ideal prospect, tell them what we want to sell them, how often, what's the frequency, how much they're going to pay, what they're going to get for it. Then once we know that, then systematize the heck out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess um, I mean, something that you've probably come across a lot with people building businesses and entrepreneurs is obviously, uh, you know, the founder or the main entrepreneur at the beginning. Uh, sometimes it's difficult for them to find the right people to surround themselves with. They, they kind of want to do everything. It's very difficult for them to succession plan because you know, it's their baby and all of that. So um, talk to me a little bit about that process of when somebody kind of comes out of being like the be all end all one man show and how one woman show whatever, and how it's really critical that they start to find skill sets to augment theirs. Yeah, so if you're an early in our growth model, like say stage three, okay, if you can't find good talent there, you don't have a compelling enough mission, because people won't align with it. I ran the mm -hmm. New York City Marathon and it's run by mostly volunteers and it's one of the best run events I've ever been involved in ever. And as a runner, I never had to stop because there was ever a time you had to wait. And, you know, you go to certain places where people are paid and it's not run that well. Well, in the early stages, it's more about alignment. If you've got a compelling vision, you're going to get people to align around you. When you get into the later stages, yes, if you don't have if you don't have the proper systems and at that point, the systems, the business model, if you can't start leveraging to your team, then that's a problem with the ego or the, the psyche of the business owner. They can't let go and they can't let this business be anything other than about them. So in other words, you know, and, and a business we have always found will never outperform its owner. Like we're not going to just say, oh, well, in spite of Mr. or Ms. So-and-so, yeah. we're just going to outperform in spite of them. It's never going to happen. And so if the, if the person really has to be in the center and, and have what we call a celebrity business, 
that's okay. Just acknowledge it and try to be the best stage two or three business you can be. And don't try to attempt seven because your, 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 your managers, your team, they're not going to hang around. They're going to leave anyway. So right. you either have to learn to let go and let them outperform you because they will. And that might be what you're afraid of, of becoming redundant or becoming uh, not needed anymore. Um, or you, you shrink the business down and be a great stage two or stage three business. Yeah, no, it is. And I see that that sometimes that's that's a, a challenge. And particularly, I mean, if you're used to just getting things done in a particular way, it's hard sometimes to hand them off to somebody else and then to be okay with them doing it differently in a different way, as long as you end up with the same result. And that, that just can be difficult sometimes um, for people. So can you um, just give me an example of, you don't have to name names here, but just an example of a couple of clients you've worked with who went through this process and what the, what the outcome was? Sure. Well, we started with a company that um, ended up going public and, you know, we, they, wow. they did not have a compelling or aligned vision. Um, we were able to get that um, we were able to get that in place for them. And then once they went out to the market and they started to sell, everybody had the same, you know, language, the same scripting, no matter who you talk to, they put a lot of confidence in their buyers, the people that needed to invest in them. So their first sale was to investors who were going to fund the startup. That was their very first client. And then when they started um, selling their product to the customer, um, they, they had enough money behind them to create best in class products. So while it was inexpensive and it was a hard launch, it was incredibly successful launch. And then another example would be a company, which is more common that we would meet who did a lot of the right things, but out of sequence. So they had multiple locations, they had a couple locations, but they hadn't, their, they, their uh, mission was kind of flat. You know, a second generation owner, and it was really a lot of the team was loyal to the founder, not to the not to the next generation. And, and so not only did the new owner have to win over, but they had to they had to circle back to stage one briefly to update the mission, vision, values, purpose. And one of the mistakes we see companies make a lot, uh, John, is that they they fall in love with their pricing. They think, you know, times are tough. I need to discount. I'm doing it for them. And the reality is that, no, you don't have to. You need to charge for what you're valuable in because your pricing is the number one way in which you communicate with your clients. Because yeah. as soon as you tell them what you charge, you tell them what you are, but then you tell them what they are. You know, and if you're yeah. discounting, 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 and they're like, well, wait a minute, I thought I was like your platinum customer. Why is it mm -hmm. discounting? Well, you know, then there becomes this conflict. So, so what we do a lot is we have to kind of go back and refresh, you know, like reboot the system, look at pricing, look at the mission, update the core values. What's the messaging? Is it meeting where your clients are right now? And, a, and an exercise that we like to do is we take the top five complaints in the marketplace right now. And we ask ourselves, does the business model answer those five complaints? And to what degree do they answer those five complaints? And it's almost always that three or four, they don't answer at a, at a high level you know, because the right. market is always evolving as well. And so then we say, let's circle back. And we have a few different, a uh, few different exercises that take us through their processes. And we say, okay, let's make sure we're addressing all of those. And then nat naturally you update, you know, image, branding, pricing, you know, packaging, whatever is necessary to make sure you're meeting the current demands of the marketplace. Uh, yeah. And then from, and then from there, you know, staffing and finance mm -hmm. and lines of credit, all the, the mechanical, logistical, systemized um, uh, activities then kick in from there. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a I think that's a great takeaway for people there, especially running businesses again around pricing is really do look at the value. And yes, it may seem counterintuitive to you in a period like this to actually look at maybe my pricing is too low. Maybe I actually need to raise my pricing. Uh, because of the value and and because people trust and that's and that sometimes feels counterintuitive but it really at the end of the day it's you have to analyze your business and really ask yourself the honest question about what kind of value you are creating for your clients and if that's a value that can get can uh, warrant a premium you should be looking for a premium yeah and and the reality is is when money's tight people don't have enough money to to redo it a second time so they're willing to pay a little bit more to make sure it's, 
mm -hmm. done right the first time. So if you're that person, great. Then, then there, the key in business is to find passionate clients that are willing to overpay for your services, not pay for your services, overpay. I mean, if you right. think of any boarding match or, or concert you've ever went to, if we liked the team or we liked the performer, we overpaid because we could have taken the cheapest seat in the, in the back of the venue, but we wanted to get as close as possible. So we overpaid for the same show. And that's what, as a business, you want. You want your clients to overpay and, and pay for your premium or close to premium services. And, and just by their selection of how they're engaging with you, they are telling you how much they love you beyond the utility of your product or service. Yeah, no, that was fantastically put, um, Carl. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're coming to the end here. All of Carl's information is going to be below this video, so you'll be able to find out more. Um, but before we go, Carl, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and your company. Sure. So Seven Stage Advisors was, uh, was born out of uh, by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. We say that we were you before we became us. You know, so we've, we've been there, we've done that, and, and we want to help other companies grow the way that we've done in our career. And so Seven Stage Advisors was born um, as a team of subject matter experts in strategy, business development, um, operations, and finance to, to bolt on and just put, um, uh, give you more management horsepower to grow. Look for us at carlgould.com or sevenstageadvisors.com. And, and John, for your uh, viewers, we, um, we give a free, uh, what we call business analysis, which is up to a two hour, uh, this is our give back to the entrepreneurial community, mm -hmm. up to a two hour growth um, advisory session. If any of your uh, uh, vis uh, uh, viewers wanna take us up on it, we'll spend up to two hours with them and we'll give them up to five ways to grow their business if they'd like. That's fantastic. I, I really would encourage people to, uh, to take Carl up on that offer. Uh, hey, listen, we all need, insight and advice and uh, and let's get ready i mean now's the time to get ready for for the future after the year and that, that we've had so i mean i would encourage people to go check it out my name is john golden sales pop online sales magazine and pipeliner crm thanks again to carl and i will see you all for another interview very soon thank you